thank you for joining our today's webinar. Um, today's webinar subject is uh, the rise of ESG in Asia and Hong Kong. I'm the moderator of uh, this webinar. My name is Dixon Wong from Financial Services Team of Invest Hong Kong. Um, as a background, uh, as an international financial center, primary international um, country, Hong Kong plays an important role in promoting sustainable development, especially in Asia. Um, um, today, we are very lucky to have uh, a ESG expert uh, from S&P Global Ratings. Um, Eric Cristino uh, will share this about uh, the trend globally and in Hong Kong. Um, briefly uh, describe they, uh, Eric. Eric is a director of uh, S&P Global Ratings specializing in uh, ESG product. He's responsible for managing products and help companies to communicate financially material ESG information and unlock access to sustainable finance instruments such as green bonds and ESG linked loans. Eric is also active in engaging market participants to raise the awareness on the importance of underlying and managing business risks related to ESG. Um, before I pass it over to Eric, um, there will be uh, five to 10 minutes Q&A after the presentation uh, by Eric. Uh, Eric, if you're ready, I pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dixon for the introduction, very kind introduction, as well as the invitation to speak with uh, members of the community of Invest Hong Kong. Um, I will just take my time now to share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen right now. Dixon, can you give me a thumbs up maybe, if you can see my screen? Perfect, awesome. Um, so again, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm here today really to share about uh, the information around ESG that we know is growing in the world and how Hong Kong can uh, start benefiting from the rise of ESG-related financing and ESG focus from investors in companies that are found to be responsible. Now to begin with, I want to share with you this uh, very recent information from the World Economic Forum. So every year, the World Economic Forum uh, conducts this survey called the Global Risk Perception Survey, where they uh, reached out to more than 250 business leaders around the world to ask them questions around what are the things that they, they worry about? What are the things that cost them their sleep? You know, things that are likely to happen and things that are very impactful in their opinion. Now, as you can see here, there are a few dotted points. They're very small right now but I just wanted to focus on the distribution of the colors that you see. So blue colors indicate economic issues, a green color indicates uh, environmental issues, uh, yellow, geopolitical, orange, societal issues, as well as uh, purple, technological issues. Now you can see that the congregation of these, uh, these data points, the further it is, the top right-hand corner indicates the more likely it is and the more impactful they are. So let's, let us zoom in to see what are the issues that have been concerning our global leaders right now. Now the top 10 of these issues based on the survey conducted, a large majority of them are related to environmental issues. Some of them are a societal issue, technological issues, and geopolitical issues. But highly concentrated, we are looking at environmental issues. You know, failure to climate action, uh, extreme weather, biodiversity loss. These are some of the things that you know, in the past, if we look at the same survey, for example, five to six years ago when the World Economic Forum first started this entire survey, these things do not even feature in the top 10 of the, of the uh, potential issues that business leaders are concerned with. But today, and if you again look at the report from uh, previous two or three years, you can see increasingly this becomes more and more important. And now, as of this year's report, uh, environmental issues are top number one uh, in, in their perspective. And there is good reason for that. I mean, if we see the number of uh, challenges faced by businesses, um, PG&E, for example, Pacific Gas and Electric, a company in, uh, in the U.S. that has been operational for more than 120 years, uh, they were built 
as the first company to face bankruptcy because of climate change. So PG&E at the beginning of, of last year, they were declared bankrupt due to uh, wildfire that was caused by climate change. So these risks are becoming important. Not only are businesses now asked about what is the impact of uh, their operations to the environment, the environment itself and the society itself are now having an impact on businesses. So these are some of the things that uh, are increasingly becoming more real, uh, becoming more tangible in the face of uh, these business leaders. Now I have a summary here. Let me just move my uh, token a little bit to show us what are the changes across the years in terms of the, the survey results. Again, you can see the color change for the top half of the screen. You can see these are the top risk in terms of likelihood. Again, moving from technological issues to societal issues, and then the past four years, everything is on environmental issues. And at the bottom half, we're looking at the risk in terms of impact. You know, again, moving from uh, ec economic issues uh, to societal and now environmental issues. Again, very much, topics that are falling under the ESG coverage. And so business leaders now understand that ESG has a significant impact on how they are running business, on profit and loss of the company. This has really shifted the perception of ESG and also sustainable finance. So if you look at the beginning of socially responsible investing or sustainability, uh, sustainable investing since the early days, uh, I would say from the early uh, mid-1960s, when socially responsible investing start to crop up in the market. It started off as a very uh, basic understanding of what is socially responsible. For example, uh, stop investing in certain types of industries, you know, vice sector, entertainment and gaming, for instance, tobacco industry. And that has moved along to the current form of socially responsible investments, which is integrating information on responsible businesses. So things around what is the health and safety indicator or performance of a company? What is the company's policies around anti-money laundering? What is the company's policy around supply chain, uh, non-existence of child labor, or fair, uh, fair uh, payment of wages, for example? as well as uh, environmental protection, you know, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. These are some of the things that investors we see starting to incorporate into their business decisions. And a lot of organizations out there are also putting together their resources and their thinking cap to help businesses as well as investors to make this integration easier. So in 2005, for example, we have the principles of responsible investing coming up and providing really one of the more prominent uh, guidelines available today for investors and businesses to start incorporating. The green bonds principle, again, something that has been coming up very, very uh, prominently in the past few years, uh, especially in Hong Kong market and the greater China, where uh, the market for green bond is really concentrated uh, in, in, in those markets right now, in Asia Pacific region. And in 2016, you know, TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Now, this is where uh, a group of the G20 finance ministers are starting to recommend investors and businesses to disclose information about how is the climate, how is the environment impacting your business and apply certain level of scenario analysis into that picture so that your stakeholders, when they evaluate your business, before they put money into your business, they can understand if we invest in this organization, in these funds, in these equities, in the long term, 10, 15 years, where climate keeps changing, how will the uh, operational capability of these businesses will be? What is the financial health of these businesses will be, of these funds will be? So this is some of the uh, more recent guidelines provided. Um, and again, so, so on and so forth. And as of today, for example, we've seen more and more investors allocating money in alignment with uh, ESG. So they have committed and allocated funds to invest in uh, companies that are found to be socially and environmentally responsible. 
Now, in the past, we've seen a lot of anecdotal examples that are saying that you know, investing in ESG-aligned businesses or responsible businesses you know, is a mere uh, PR exercise where you're just doing good. But here in S&P, we have uh, managed to pull some data. We have run some uh, analysis to show that ESG-aligned investments demonstrate outperformance in some of the cases that we see here. So in particular, when we look at the S&P 500, um, if we compare against some of the thematic, environmental uh, thematic uh, uh, index that we have at the moment, the S&P 500 Carbon Efficient Index, uh, this index, for example, aligns investment with uh, carbon efficiency or how much uh, carbon dioxide an organization emits per million dollar of revenue generates. And a couple of the other indices here, out of all these data points, we can see that you know, 14, or 15, 14 out of 15 of them are actually outperforming its benchmark. So if you look at it row by row basis, you can see that those within the red box, most of them outperform those on the left hand side, which is not on the, uh, which is the benchmark. Now, this is showing that if you invest in these companies, you are generating a higher performance. Now, why won't you do that if you also know that you are contributing to environmental savings? So at the bottom of the table, you can see that that is the amount of carbon reduction that these funds will generate if you invest in them. So up to 60% of uh, carbon efficiency if you actually invest in these funds. So not only are you doing good for the environment, you're also generating uh, positive returns higher than the uh, benchmark that we see here. So again, a uh, very good data point to show that you know, investors are now looking into investing along the lines of ESG, not just for PR, not just to look good, but also to generate some uh, outperformance that they can give to the investors. Now, in, in, in a more recent time, we also see uh, information here populated that says uh, ESG-aligned investments are found to be performing better during times of crisis during this pandemic time. So this data point that I'm showing here is data from March 2020. Uh, overall, we can see that the ESG aligned funds are performing better. Yes, they are also uh, uh, on a negative zone. Uh, there's a reduction in, in, in their performance, but compared to their conventional non-ESG funds, uh, most of them are doing better. So. Again, just showing another example, a real example of how uh, investing in ESG companies, investing in ESG aligned funds are generating uh, better financial returns for investors. Now, earlier I mentioned about the United Nations principles of responsible investments. So they are also uh, monitoring and recommending companies to sign up to their principles, which essentially is saying uh, that these funds and these organizations are committed to engage companies that they're investing in on ESG topics, to ask them questions about what are they doing to make sure that the businesses and their investments are responsible. And they themselves are committing to reporting these progress on a year-to-year -year basis every year, essentially. Now, the growth of the number of organizations uh, that, are, that have signed up to the UNPRI has grown tremendously. So today, we have close to 2,000 signatories, more than 2,000 signatories now, representing more than 90 trillion in asset under management. So we're talking a huge sum of money that are now being uh, evaluated and that are now uh, under the auspices of organizations that have signed up to these principles. And these includes organizations in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong Monetary Authority, for example, is one of the signatory. And we know that they, they have reported that uh, in the exchange fund, which they manage, uh, they have allocated uh, up to two billion uh, US dollars now on investments that are aligned with ESG, for instance. So again, real examples of how these institutions and organizations are investing money along the lines of ESG. Now, some of the key drivers that we see here in Asia Pacific. Now, this data is from the Global uh, Investment Alliance. And some of the data points that they provided here are, are specific to two of the markets in Asia. So only Japan and Australia, New Zealand. Unfortunately, we are not able to find data for other uh, markets in Asia. 
But I think some of the examples that we, we see here will be able to tell us how the trend and the growth of ESG investing in this region. So globally, uh, as of 2018, end of 2018, there are about $32 trillion of asset under management that are allocated for ESG funds. Now for Japan, um, we see that they have allocated about $1 trillion into ESG linked financing. It is about 3% of the total funds uh, allocated, but what is very positive here is the amount of growth rate that we see in the amount of money that is allocated for these type of finance, uh, these type of investments. We have seen more than 300% in increase in sustainable investing assets in Japan. And as you know, uh, Japan, Japanese investments typically go beyond the shore. So not only are they investing uh, domestically, these funds are also being uh, allocated for investments outside of Japan. And I do have some of the data uh, in the subsequent slides, uh, which should be quite encouraging for some of the businesses in Hong Kong. Now, keeping to that uh, talking point, um, in Australia and New Zealand, we've also seen 50% of growth in amount of sustainable investment assets, followed by Canada and the US. So really some of these um, growth in uh, sustainable investments are happening in Asia Pacific at our own backyard. And you know, Hong Kong as, as a region, as one of the financial hub, we should be really looking into tapping this opportunity. Now, what about the amount of assets a proportion of assets under management that are ESG aligned. Uh, Australia and New Zealand actually leads globally from that perspective. More than 60% of their current asset under management are aligned with ESG. So a lot of super fund, super annuation fund, which is investing um, a lot of their uh, citizens' uh, pension funds have made commitments to align investments to ESG and the data shows. So more than 60% of the uh, ANZ's uh, funds right now are invested along the lines of ESG. Again, followed by Canada, Europe, and Japan. Now, what about the banks and sustainable financing instruments? These are some of the sustainable financing instruments that are available today from green bonds, sustainability bonds, social bonds, green loans, and sustainability loans. Again, from this chart, we can see a very, very healthy increase in a number of uh, issuances, a volume of issuances that are happening worldwide. Now, if we look at it into different regions, um, Asia Pacific, while we are not the largest yet, if you look at the dark blue color there, uh, we have shown a steady increase in growth in number of, of uh, in the volume of uh, ESG link financing that is growing. Now, on the right hand side, again, we see Hong Kong companies have been uh, benefiting a lot from the issuances of green bonds. And there are some of the key, uh, reasons why this is happening in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, which I will touch on later. So uh, some of the more recent issuances that I can highlight here uh, include uh, issuances by Langham Hospitality, Linkreed, NWD, Swire Properties, and Wheelock. Again, the sum that they're raising is, is not small. These are uh, some of the uh, bigger investments that we see, uh, again, with a healthy uh, trend of increase in uh, green bonds, uh, we do expect more and more coming up from, from Hong Kong and uh, surrounding region as well. Now, going back to the ESG link financing and investing, um, earlier I touched upon how uh, investments and asset under management that are allocated to ESG is benefiting Hong Kong companies. If we look at the data from S&P, we have some of the more prominent ESG uh, indices that I've listed here, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which has been running for uh, 20 years now, uh, the S&P ESG Family Index, and S&P Carbon Efficient Index. All in all, in total, we have about more than $12 uh, billion asset under management. They are tracing these family of indices. Now, specifically to Hong Kong, I've been able to pull out uh, information from the S&P Carbon Efficient Index. Now, this is one of the indices that the Japanese funds actually allocate money to. They have allocated about $10 billion uh, in asset under management for both the Domestic Carbon Efficient Index and the Global Carbon Efficient Index, or here what we call it as the X-Japan Large Mid-Cap Carbon Efficient Index. Now, this index is built based on disclosures by listed companies that made it to the large mid cap, uh, S&P large mid cap index, carbon disclosures. 
So I have pulled out some of the names of the Hong Kong companies here. So Jardine Matheson, CK Hutchinson, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the companies that have benefited from the, uh, the funds that are allocated for ESG investments. Now on the right hand side, this is where things get interesting. We see that this is the carbon disclosure status of each of these companies. Now, there are two different statuses here. One is non-disclosed and the other is disclosed. What does this mean? This means that companies that are under this, uh, that has disclosed status means the company actually publicly disclosed the information of carbon footprint. So uh, for some of us who are more technical and understand the depth of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions accounting, we are talking about the scope one or direct emissions, as well as scope two, the indirect emissions of these companies. These data are being looked at by investors um, and they want to make des investment decisions based on that. So from S&P perspective, for example, because we are helping those investors to uh, make that, those, uh, to support their investment decisions, uh, we've been able to pull together inf information from publicly available sources, as well as disclosures that these organizations, organizations make to some of the NGOs like CDP, for example, uh, to inform these decisions. So the more information you provide, the more accurate information that you make available uh, in public, which demonstrates transparency, uh, the more benefits you can get. Uh, and one of the benefits is being uh, involved and included in some of these uh, indices that are available out there. Now in Hong Kong, the regulators are also aware of some of these benefits that the businesses can uh, take advantage of from the ESG sector. The Hong Kong MA, for example, has now introduced the pilot bond grant scheme, which really encourages uh, organizations to issue bonds in Hong Kong. So for first time issuers, you know, there is a sizable amount of incentive that you can benefit from. And again, the HKQAA has their own green bond grant scheme as well uh, for uh, issuances that are using HKQ, HKQAA. Uh, there are also uh, uh, some of uh, incentives that companies can benefit from. So again, the regulators are trying to make uh, uh, Hong Kong as a positive place for companies to, to, to start benefiting from ESG uh, investments and ESG loans and ESG financing. Now, just to uh, wrap up uh, a little bit, uh, why is S&P in this space? As you know, uh, S&P is one of the largest uh, providers of credit rating and data. Uh, we have been in the market providing this information for more than 125 years. So we've been working with market participants, investors, corporates, uh, and understand what are the information that they need to make a business decision, to make investment decisions. And in terms of ESG, we have been in the space for more than 20 years. Since the beginning of Dow Jones Sustainability Indices, for example, we partnered with Rubico Sam to uh, incorporate ESG information to build the index. Uh, in 2016, we've acquired uh, corporate environmental data provider TrueCost to augment our data, pro uh, provide, uh, data services. And as recent as earlier this year, in January, we have acquired uh, the SAM business or the sustainability rating arm of Rubico SAM. So now we have access of all this information and we are making them available to investors as well as corporates to make sure that your information is uh, made available at a, on a credible basis and a transparent basis so that you can benefit from the ESG efforts that has been put in place as well as benefiting from all these trends that I've shared earlier. Um, I have seven minutes left and I'll pass the time back so they have more time for question and answer now. So Dixon, back to you. Thank you, Eric. Um, very insightful section. Um, people on the call, on the Zoom, if you have any questions, please feel free to flow through and we can see the questions uh, and we can ask Eric for his guidance. Um, perhaps uh, I can raise my first question first. Um, it sounds like uh, ESG is one of the key considerations for investors, in particular the institutional investors, where they put a lot of uh, efforts on wealth, but as well as uh, ESG. Um, 
how, what do you think about Hong Kong? It seems like um, from the presentation that you just gone through, it looks like Hong Kong is catching up a bit. Um, it's still in the early stage or middle stage, or do you think there's any major barriers uh, to ESG integrations? Uh, Eric, um, Eric I, I, a, a quick yeah. one. Could, could you uh, um, hide your presentation? Uh, I will stop sharing the screen, yeah. yes. Please stop sharing it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'll answer that question, Dixon, in two parts. Um, the first part around well, you know, where Hong Kong is in terms of uh, ESG. Now, I believe uh, the Hong Kong regulators have implemented a lot of uh, incentives and provide a lot of guidance in how companies and investors can uh, tap into this market. Now, we've, we've known that Hong Kong Stock Exchange has uh, you know, implemented Comply or Explain uh, ESG disclosure requirements, for example, for listed companies. And that is one of the uh, very, very important steps for businesses to take on, you know, whether you're listed or not, to be honest, because what it does is it provides guidance for companies to start providing uh, key information, data points that investors need to make those decisions. So some of the investors, uh, pension funds, for example, or institutional funds, they have mandate or they have made commitments. It could it could range from a general, uh, a more general ESG link investments or an environment specific goals. For example, we want to reduce our carbon footprint from our investments. And in order for them to make that decision, they need to know when they invest in a particular fund or in a particular uh, company, they need to know what is the carbon footprint of that company, for example, and how can they know that? They can only know that if the company provides that disclosure. And the regulators understand that. So they make, uh, they, they make new regulation. At the same time, they provide guidance, right? So Hong Kong uh, EX, for example, they, they have uh, come up with uh, fairly detailed guidelines on how companies can start with those information. Um, and I think that's a very good effort and initiative by the regulator to help companies. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned about the pension fund, sovereign wealth fund, and actually these are you know, the uh, pretty big companies or large companies uh, focusing on ESG or sustainability. And how, how can medium or small companies that would be able to benefit from, from ESG in your view? Yeah, I think right now, um, you know, of course there's a lot of anecdotal examples of what could be, what could have been, but I think I would, I would go back to what has been done or how companies have benefited. Um, there is an example by DBS Bank, for, uh, for instance, and recently they have extended an ESG link financing to uh, small and medium enterprise um, in Singapore, so not in Hong Kong, but they have expanded that uh, uh, financing to companies, uh, small and medium sized companies. Uh, we do see they are getting active in, in Hong Kong as well. Recently they financed a green bond issue, I believe, uh, with LinkRead. And so we are hoping that you know that type of financing will be made available all across uh, the markets that they are, including in Hong Kong. Um, and so there are also other banks that are active in Hong Kong, and we imagine that they will uh, follow suit and provide similar uh, uh, products to sustainable, uh, sorry, small and medium enterprises in Hong Kong as well. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, a few questions uh, from the screen here. Um, Let's go through the first one. Where are we on the development of more retail focused ESG ETF products with an Asia focus? Hmm. Um, so I think that is happening from the S&P perspective. I think this, that is more where my index uh, division can probably give you a more concrete answer and examples. But from my observation, um, we need more data to become available. So maybe I can pull my experience from my time with uh, market intelligence. One of the issues uh, we face when they are building uh, ETF that are Asia focus is the availability of data. So right now with the data that is available, even within our own universe, 
uh, we see there's only about 30% of companies uh, in every major stock exchange in Asia that are disclosing environmental information or ESG information uh, in a form that we can take, in a form that is comparable. So uh, it goes back to companies' readiness and cooperation with companies. If they can start to provide clean data, accurate data, um, consistently across a number of years, that's when uh, we can help to, uh, in, you know, uh, companies that are building funds, building ETFs uh, to, to provide the information so they can create one for our region. Okay, thank you. Another question. Uh, as you said, ESG has a very bright future, but as a member of the company, I can't change the company's leadership thinking. How can I personally participate in the ESG investment part? Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, there, there are, so when you talk about uh, personally participating in ESG investing, there are some uh, uh, ESG funds that are available to retail actually, uh, but they are US focused at the moment. So, um, you know, if you are interested, you can, you know, definitely look into some of those funds that are available and you can make your investments there. Now, at, at, a, at your professional level, probably, I think what is very important is education, right? Showing the tangible uh, benefits that a company and organization can get out of uh, you know, being a responsible business. So other than, you know, being financially, uh, providing financial benefits, um, you know, we can also talk about the social returns that you can get. Uh, what are the number of employments you can create and, uh, you know, giving back to society. And these are some of the things that you can highlight uh, as an opportunity in, in the ESG discussions. Now, when I talk about uh, potential benefits from businesses, there are also examples from, from the region. For example, JD.com has reported that um, the green products have uh, shown a much more rapid increase in growth than their conventional product. So as much as 70% higher. So we see that you know, companies that want to open up a new uh, product line, for example, they can also start to tap into uh, branding their product as responsible. Of course, do it credibly, not, not in a greenwashing uh, way. And, and that will be, be able to help us appeal to the newer demographics, to customers that are now more keen and more aware about uh, business impacts through the products and through the supply chain. Um, another question. Um, we are a newly listed company in recreational and tourism industry in Hong Kong. May I know if there's any chance of getting rated of S&P ESG ratings? Uh, so far, we are not getting invited. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you, you may touch base yeah. with him or her later on, or you feel free to answer yes. these questions, Eric. Okay, I, I, can, I can talk about it at a high level and then uh, you know, maybe I can get in touch with that individual after this. Um, so there are two types of uh, rating or scoring as we call it. So one is a solicited rating, which means that the company invites the service provider to evaluate and, and rate them. So that can be done. So if you're interested, you can invite us and then we'll rate you. And the other one is called unsolicited, uh, un, unsolicited rating. Typically unsolicited rating happens because there are stakeholders out there, typically investors, that says we are keen to get an understanding of the ESG performance of this particular company. And they specifically mention the company. And so, you know, service providers like ourselves or others would then go in and do an assessment of those companies, uh, whether they are invited or not. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen any other questions coming through the, to my screen, but um, you mentioned about the, the uh, positive size, upside in ESG and uh, investors are putting their the investments and their advantages to, to invest in ESG. Uh, as we are from an Invest Hong Kong perspective, we are an investment promotion agency, and we have colleagues, you know, on this call uh, from all over over the world and based in Hong Kong as headquarters. And uh, we we would like to seek your your expertise on how we can promote ESG in Hong Kong or overseas. 
uh, as part of our, you know, investment promotion program? How 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 can we do better? Uh, you know, uh, mm. also bearing in mind of our mandate of keeping, uh, you know, attracting companies into Hong Kong. Yeah, so. I think what Hong Kong uh, has, has done really well is in making the, the information readily available. So when you talk about who are the investors in Hong Kong that has ESG funds, for instance, the Securities and Futures Commission, the SFC, actually has a list of that made publicly available. So you can see who actually the funds in Hong Kong that has the ESG mandate. And I think at the moment, there are at least 20 of them, as I recall. And so these are some of the things that you know, as, as Invest, Invest Hong Kong, maybe you want to look into this as well. Um, and, and some of the incentives that are made available by regulators. Again, uh, not many markets and regulators actually have that available. In Asia Pacific, I can only think about one other at the top of my head. Um, and that actually puts Hong Kong in quite a favorable position in, in terms of just looking at amount of information available, amount of incentive available. Thank you. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? Oh, I've got uh, one more question from the screen. Hong Kong government is promoting Hong Kong as a green financial center. What are the benefits for issues issuing a green bond? Hmm. So the financial benefits of a green bond, um, that is one question that a, a lot of issuers have asked. So. In a few cases, it has been shown to have some pricing benefits, um, but it has not been shown across all types of green bonds. But what we've seen is how and who the green bonds actually attract. The type of investors it attracts are usually the investors that will invest in it in the long term. So um, we are probably seeing you know, the use of green bond as a way to attract institutional investors that will be in the game for the long time, which means that volatility is not going to be a, 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 as big an issue as compared to other types of bond investments. Um, and, and also interest. I think most of the green bonds that are issued in Asia has a very high uh, demand. Uh, many times it, it is oversubscribed by a multiples of three to four X. So uh, that is some of the considerations that you can think about as well. Uh, I also want to highlight um, other types of financing benefits, and that is more concrete. So ESG linked loans, for example, or green loans, uh, those type of loans have been shown to provide more uh, financial benefit. Um, one example from S&P, for instance, we recently launched a green uh, ESG linked loan in Europe, and the issuer managed to get a 15% BIPs discount if they are able to show improvement in the ESG score. So, you know, direct, direct uh, discount on your interest rate if you are able to show perform a better performance in ESG. So that is one of the things that, you know, issuers or companies that are looking for financing can start to tap into as well. Thank you. Um, seems like there are no more questions uh, from the audience. Um, I would like to thank you, Eric, for your time, your valuable insight, as well as your uh, inspiring uh, information given to us today. And uh, if there are any further questions uh, from the audience, please uh, let us know, and we will feed that back to Eric. Uh, thank you, Eric, again, for your time. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. That's the end of thank the Thank you, Dixon, and Invest Hong Kong for, for the invite. Thank you.